welcome to this edition of Able to Learn Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently abled. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler, and with me today is the Paratransit Planning Committee of Montpelier, and I'm going to have everybody introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Peter Johnke. I'm with the Vermont Center for Independent Living, and I'm a transportation advocate and a user of the transit system. Hello, my name is Dan Courier. I'm with the Center for Vermont Regional Planning Commission. I'm the transportation planner. I am Myla Hood, and I work for VCIL as well, and I use transportation as well. And my name is Lauren Seiler, and I'm also on the transportation committee. Um, let's start with you, Dan. What is the missions and goals of the uh, Central Vermont Planning Regional uh, Planning Commission and the um, the, trans the Power Transit Committee? Sure. So the Central Regional Planning Commission is a regional planning commission. Uh, we have 23 towns in our region that, that we help do uh, municipal planning for, uh, regional planning, and that can be natural resources that can help them with energy planning, that can be a transportation study. Um, and specifically with transportation, um, we are focused on a, the implementation of a new paratransit system that the Green Mountain Transit has mm -hmm. proposed for our region. And so uh, through a grant uh, with the um, um, uh, CTAA, which is the Community Transportation Association of America, um, we have uh, brought together um, stakeholders as well as users of the existing uh, transportation system. Just when you say stakeholders, what exactly does that mean? Sure. A uh, lot of people in our audience might not know what that means. Sure, sure. Um, it really, it's, uh, it's older adults and, uh, and people with disabilities that use the, uh, the existing uh, bus routes. And so um, whether it's a rider or someone uh, that calls in and gets a, um, a deviation of the bus or, or even uh, uses a volunteer driver um, to, uh, to get to and from, whether it's an appointment, uh, shopping, or whatever they do um, on the bus. And so What's a deviation? A deviation is actually um, a request that um, a rider would make uh, 24 hours in advance um, to uh, Green Mountain Transit. And that deviation uh, is up to three quarters of a mile. And actually, the bus would drive up to three quarters of a mile from the existing route. Say it's uh, Route 302, Barry Montpelier Road. It would drive three quarters of a mile uh, to the person where they live, pick them up, and then bring them back to that route. And the bus would then continue the route um, and then drop them off at their destination. Um, both of you guys being advocates, uh, I'm going to ask this question. Being that you guys use the transportation system, what problems do you see with the system? And how do you see that this power transit can fix it um, or vice versa, or not fixed. Uh, this is Peter, um, and I guess it's a little, time will tell as to whether it will fix things or cause problems. I mean, it's difficult to say until they actually implement it. Part of the process of this uh, grant is to get as much input and that uh, Green Mountain Transit will take a look at that input and see if they can, you know, create a system that's going to work for this rural area. One of the reasons we brought this together was because we know they have an existing system in Chittenden County, and we weren't sure that that system would necessarily replicate really well in a more rural area. Um, so this is one of the things that we're sort of exploring and looking at. Um, I think there are definitely pros and cons, and how it balances out is, is difficult to say. Um, well, okay. What are some of the pros? And what okay, are some so of the cons? okay, so the pros, um, and uh, Marla, if you don't mind, I'll use you as a great that's, example. That's fine. <laughs> um, is um, right now Marla uses a deviation to get to work, um, but it but because of the way the schedule works, even with the deviation, she ends up at work an hour early. Um, so hangs out for an hour before she can clock in. Um, and then it's even worse for her going home because the same deviation isn't available. So she either does a ride share with somebody or takes the regular um, commuter route and then has a family member pick her up and those kinds of things. For her, the paratransit would be wonderful because it would be a much more um, direct process. That's not to say there wouldn't be other people on the bus, um, but they would pick her up at an agreed upon time and bring her to work and then on the return trip, they would pick her up 
Um, clearly, you know, she can't be picked up before she gets off work, so that would all be coordinated. Um, and then she would get more directly home. So in those situations, um, it's absolutely a plus. Um, on the downside, um, right now with a deviated route, anybody can ask for a deviation. You don't have to have a disability. Um, so for people who don't qualify for paratransit as it's currently defined by uh, Green Mountain Transit, um, those people may lose out because they don't qualify for paratransit, but now they can no longer get a deviation to where they used to, to go off the fixed route. Um, so it's, it, we'll, we'll see. Um, uh, Marla, can you um, tell us some of the other problems that are wrong with, it, uh, with the system and how can we fix them? Well, um, as always, there's problems everywhere, but... Um, Understood. <laughs> But they, uh, I personally, I enjoy my deviations. I, I, I like the people that get on. I, I get to speak to people. I get to listen to other people's conversations. So I, I find that quite interesting. Um, as far as problems, uh, my only one, like Peter said, would be mine's getting home for the most part because they told me, I would have to go up to the mall and spend an hour up there. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to go to the mall and, and possibly spend money that I don't have to, you know? So, mm -hmm. and now I'm going to bring other big cities into the mix for a minute because okay. New York and Boston, well, New York, for example, they have something called Accessoride. Um, the problem with that paratransit system is that um, the drivers sometimes in, during cold weather would not drop you off at home, right? Or not, or don't drop you off a little bit before you get, you know, and, and, and what if it's icy or, or something like that? Will paratransit, so my question is, now that I brought up big cities and some problems, would, so paratransit would fix the whole thing or, or will it make it, uh, uh, easy, you know, um, give more drivers, give more transportation. What, what exactly will it do? Go ahead. I'll take this. Yeah, like. <laughs> please. Um, so, so some of the things that I, that I see paratransit doing is because um, it will operate the same hours that the bus operates. So, so people can have a pretty, so people can work through their schedule as they do now. And I actually feel that we'll, we'll attract some new riders to mm. paratransit that haven't been willing to, to try the bus or, or, or there's an element of the bus that they're not comfortable with. Because right now it's, it's a bus or it's nothing um, unless they qualify to get a, um, a volunteer driver to come out. And that's a different program mm. altogether. Uh, through the, the qualification uh, that people can go through, um, the car or van will come right to their house um, and, and it will come in bad weather. As long as Green Mountain Transit is operating its bus routes, mm -hmm. that uh, service will also be operating. And so, um, it, now, that being said, the drivers won't, for instance, walk the person to their door, right? You know, they'll bring them as close to the house as they can, uh, that's, you know, and then let them out from there. And so, so there is this element of concern that I've heard from a few people that are on the older adult side that say, well, it's walking in the winter time. It's the icy sidewalks that we can't manage. And so how do we go about dealing with this? And so, so trying to get someone to drop you off right at the door is always tricky. And then it's the last 10 feet that, that may be even harder for them to get to. And so, so having some maintenance um, that they need to do at their end or having someone there to greet them may be necessary as well. Green Mountain Transit will bring them as close to the door as possible. No, I also notice some, sometimes I see uh, a Green Mountain Transit bus that says special on it. Yep. Is, what exactly mm -hmm. is that? Is, that's not paratransit. No. Um, in fact, a lot of that times that's actually a, a special trip that's been requested either through our elderly and disabled program, uh, which is a, a funding source. Um, that helps to get people um, to meal sites or, or to appointments. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so those buses that say special, they're, 
those are special trips. Like a Cabot um, has a bus that runs all the way out there to pick up seniors. And then they eat at the, um, is it Blue Marble Peter? What's the I name think it, the I think it's the Twin, Twin Valley. Twin Valley, thank yes. you. Twin Valley um, um, meal site, uh, which is a senior center. Um, mm -hmm. And that's on Route 2 um, in, uh, in Plainfield. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so in that case, it, it's a lot, you know, that bus is a special. That bus will still operate for those type of trips. And the paratransit type of system that we'll see is Green Mountain Transit has a series of sedans um, as well as vans. It may even be a bus, depending on the number of people that need to be picked up. They may, may still send out a bus as long as the bus can um, get to where it needs to go, have a safe spot to pick people up, as well as return, be able to turn around and come back. So Do you, um, now what's the difference between art, I think is RTC or are the, uh, the red buses yep. versus the parent transit. What, what is the difference between the two so, systems? So RCT, that's just another um, uh, transit provider in the state of Vermont. And so um, they currently run a deviated system. Um, am I right, Peter? Yes. And, and they have volunteer drivers that pr uh, primarily do a, a, a bit more of a, a if, you're, if you're on my route, I will pick you up kind of scenario, right? Mm -hmm. They'll get a whole route with all these people to pick up. So they'll gather a bunch of people on a single car ride or a single bus ride, bring them to their destinations, and then return them home. Um, it'll, uh, Green Mountain Transit, that's what they currently operate as. Mm -hmm. So moving to the paratransit will be totally separate. It will no longer be that bus. Um, it'll be um, a driver of that car um, going out and picking people up, similar to how um, RCT does its, um, um, of it does its volunteer drivers. Yeah. Well, the, they, well, let me ahead. just add in there, because there may be a little bit of confusion, because sometimes people will see the red RCT bus in this area, and that's um, a specific commuter route um, for the U.S. Route 2, and that's a joint operation between um, RCT that operates out of St. Johnsbury and Green Mountain Transit, and so they share, and so they each have like a couple of runs, uh, morning and afternoon, and so if the, if you see that bus in Montpelier, that's it's just part of the U.S. Route Two commuter route, which has nothing to do with paratransit. Yeah. Okay, now in terms of times, because I know that the transit does not run on a Sunday. Right. Okay. A lot of people are complaining about that. It is because of will the paratransit. Um, or will GMTA give more time now that this trans now that this power transit is in going to be in swing? Will it change the times that the bus is running? Will there be more um, buses running on Sunday? Because what if somebody wants to go to church or something like that, or a, a, a religious um, place? Yep, and they can't because they don't have ways. Yep. So well, there. it's my understanding right now that what GMT is doing um, to a number of its routes, including the Hospital Hill routes, that's the Montpelier route, as well as the Berry Hospital Hill, is yeah. um, they're going to make those um, bi-directional uh, so that someone, um, oh, so this may actually help you, Marla, okay. uh, to get to where you need to go, because by, by having it bi-directionally on this every 60 minutes, it may actually get you um, home more efficiently. Well, wait a minute. If it's every 60 minutes, there's buses that run every half an hour mm -hmm. in mid morning or morning. Yep. And then 12 o'clock they go well, or midday. Wait, I'm, can you alleviate yeah. the confusion so for our viewers? Th 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 there, there's some there's some changes to the midday route that's happening right now. So that commuter route that runs along 302 and has a midday bus that would actually go away. That midday bus it would still be called um, the 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 commuter route, right? And so the Montpelier commuter. Um, and run to Barry and back. Um, those particular hours um, would be changed slightly, so the schedule would be revised. Um, and the the um, and the Barry Montpelier Hospital Hill routes would actually be extended slightly, so their hours would change a little bit, as well as how frequent the bus would be traveling back and forth. The um, your question about Sunday service, um, yes, that has been identified as a need. It's currently not being proposed uh, to be added. So right now, no Sunday service is being offered, and they're not proposing to add any Sunday service at this time. Mm -hmm. That in a, in a study that um, Green Mountain Transit just completed called the Next Gen Study, 
they, um, they developed a series of scenarios and that Sunday service falls under one of their scenarios that's um, a, a if they had to add cost to the service, like a 10% or 20% cost increase, under that scenario, then they would add Sunday service. So with some more funding, Green Mountain Transit could add Sunday service, but it's not currently being proposed. They're looking to really do a, um, a cost neutral or, or um, you know, or with inside their, their existing funding sources, be able to provide the same service or slightly better service, um, as well as adding this paratransit. In your opinion, do you think it should be increased or? As far as the uh, well, I mean, there, there. I mean, I understand the realities of transit service. So, absolutely, there's always a greater need, um, not only just for Sunday service. There's great greater needs for people who want longer hours. Um, so you have to, you know, there, there's not an unlimited pot of money. Um, so you have to balance things out. Um, and there are there are always people who are going to be happy with changes, and there are going to be people people who are unhappy with changes. It's just the reality of the situation. So. You have to really look at um, what what's going to work f for the greatest good for the greater amount of people, and that kind of goes back to what I was saying before: is we won't really know um, until we start with the implementation stuff. I'm I'm encouraged that I think there will be more benefit um, than you know uh, people getting less service, but in regardless of whatever changes, some people are always going to get less than what they had before. Um, well, I won't say always, but it's likely. And that may not be a lot of people, but there may be a few. Uh, some people will get more. And hopefully more people benefit and fewer people, you know, lose out a little bit of service that they previously had. Um, and there may be some ways, once we see how the implementation actually goes, there may be some ways to mitigate that through other funding sources, other programs that aren't part of this, you know, paratransit system. Uh, Marla, how do you see this? Uh, I mean, would you want to see um, expanded service? Well, of course, no? yes. It would be nice to be able to go shopping on a Sunday. I, I, I would, that would be my preference to begin with. But, you know, um, right now I rely on family members to do so. Mm -hmm. But it, I think Sundays would be a great opportunity for everybody. But, um, like they said, that you don't have that funding at the moment mm -hmm. and if they if they could do it great now sensitivity training is an important one now that you're gonna have this we're gonna have this paratransit uh, thing going on um, in terms of you now the paratransit I know is gonna have wheelchair lifts right yes are the drivers gonna be um, are drivers retrained, both in in the, in the um, are they trained every year on how to use the lift, or or are they going to get more training or more sensitivity training towards uh, helping customers with disabilities? Well, I'll, I'll take a crack at it. I mean, I don't I don't know what. Their it's your specific, opinion. I mean, you know. Yeah. I don't know what their specific policies are as far as how often the training goes, but. From my own experience of riding the bus, now I'm not a wheelchair user, but the current bus system is can accommodate wheelchairs and it does pick up wheelchair users. And my experience has been, with rare exception, um, I've seen drivers handle the wheelchairs very appropriately, um, be very courteous to riders, making sure they ask the right questions. Um, and I have, um, when, when I've seen something that I didn't think was appropriate, I have, you know, made a complaint. Um, so I'm not afraid to do that, but I haven't, I haven't seen it. It's, I'm, I'm very pleased with the drivers that I've interacted with and what I've seen them acting with, interacting with people with a variety of disabilities, not just physical disabilities. Um, the, now I know we don't have it here, but the PowerPoint presentation that you did last week, and, and we're going to show uh, in editing, we're going to show some of your uh, meeting. Uh, can you explain a little bit about that PowerPoint presentation and how it plays into all of this? Sure, yeah. Um, uh, part of our grant requirements was actually to develop what we call the elevator pitch, right? A presentation that you would give in three to five minutes and really help someone to understand the grant, right? And so, so you know, we're out to create a more informed ridership of this new paratransit service, right? 
you know, we want to engage directly with the users of that service, right? And so it's, uh, it's the elderly, it's uh, folks with disabilities, right? And it's their caregivers as well, you know, um, adults that will help the, that those populations get to the services or even maybe even call the services for them. Um, and then also we're out to, um, to develop an outline and then provide that outline um, to Green Mountain Transit so they understand like well, these are the needs, right? This is what the users have said their needs are. Can we make sure the service um, reflects these needs? And, and we're doing that uh, through a series of surveys. Mm -hmm. uh, we're actually just finishing up a survey. Um, the goal of the grant is also to get as much input in the beginning and throughout the process. And so that's why the, um, the, the steering committee that we have, the paratransit planning committee, is so important. Um, and having users um, that are experienced with the service um, and ha can help provide that lens um, for myself as we move forward. So. Okay. Um, now, when the grant ends, mm -hmm. where does that leave the committee and uh, future goals? of the paratransit um, because I understand that, you know, money, it, it plays a part in this yeah. and, um, you know, being a volunteer driver, mm -hmm. uh, for some folks, people want to get paid, especially when you're having people with disabilities on your bus, it's a, you want to get paid for that. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, uh, will paratransit stay if the grant is no more, or how does that work? Yeah, and so so the grant is just helping us uh, to develop a study and the outline um, and you know interactions like this, right? And really to build um, some material as well as um, help us to understand how to engage more inclusively um, in our own planning. So. I know the Central Rural Regional Planning Commission intends to um, take our, my experiences here and actually include it in our other planning that we do. So beyond the grant, um, we're learning how to plan more inclusively, um, how to encourage uh, various populations to come to meetings that they don't typically attend um, and how best to do that. But beyond the grant itself, um, there's other opportunities for the community to stay engaged. We have an existing elderly and disabled working group and that particularly um, helps us to um, focus our efforts on to spend our elderly and disabled funding, um, which is um, currently managed through the Green Mountain Transit. Mm -hmm. you know? And I am actually on that yep. committee. And Peter's on that committee as well. Um, Are you on the committee? Mark? No. <laughs> no. Um, it, <laughs> Not so, that one. <laughs> yeah, and so um, it, beyond that, there's also Green Mountain Transit has um, an ADA committee, American with Disabilities um, Committee. Um, and it currently, because, 80, uh, because paratransit only operates in Chittenden County, that's who the membership is. So it's a very urban-focused committee. We'd like to, um, the goal of the grant is also to add new rural members. As soon as paratransit is offered in our, uh, in our county, we'll want members to be added to that committee as well at Green Mountain Transit. And so adding to that committee uh, members from our own steering committee um, is a goal and identifying those people before the grant ends um, mm -hmm. is an outcome and so we want that to occur. Now, all right, um, now in terms of, okay, so future goals, paratransit's going to be in full swing. Yeah. Um, we mentioned pros and cons earlier. What are some of the pros and cons? There's pros and cons to everything. So in your opinion, um, with certain things, with pros and cons, with the, the para, it, uh, will there be bad and good with the paratransit system? Or, or how do you see that? Absolutely, there certainly will be. Um, one thing that will happen each year with the paratransit system, just like all the routes um, that GMT operates, is you know they, they do uh, service you know analysis. You know they look at the ridership. They make sure that the service they're providing is meeting the the needs. Um, and I know, um, uh, so I, I'm currently an alternate uh, member of their board, Green Mountain Transit's um, board, and so um, for Washington County. And so I know the board ha has a rural um, focus um, as rural members, and so our focus of those rural members is to make sure that the service we're being get is the service you know that matches well to our regions. And so 
one goal that um, that the board continually talks about is like how do we go about service improvements um, and how do we incorporate them um, you know really at the bring them not just from the board level but all the way down to the drivers you know the riders and making it, sure I mean of course we have some time on the clock but um, is there a cost um, I know that it's 50 cents for special needs right you know disabled riders mm -hmm. it's a dollar for everybody else mm -hmm. um, in terms of caregivers that help people on the bus to and from are they gonna have to uh, 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 are they going to have to pay or is there a cost for paratransit I have not seen the list of cost yet I presume the cost would be zero but that's just my assumption mm -hmm. um, I, there may be a small cost like that 50 cent cost you talk about you should know the cost is um, doesn't recoup the actual operating. Uh, we get a lot of uh, Green Mountain Transit gets a lot of money um, from the um, FTA um, and as well as the state of Vermont. And FTA so FTA is what the Federal Transit Administration. Uh -huh. And so um, and so those funds go directly to the operation of the um, of our transit provider, right? The Green Mountain Transit. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we get a lot of money from the state of Vermont, and then a smaller portion um, comes from the towns. And then even smaller portion of that is actual the fare boxes, right? The dollar you pay or the 50 cents you pay. And so, um, and so they're not out to really recoup much at the fare box level. Um, uh, so so if it's, it may absolutely in the end be free. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, as Dan said, we, we haven't seen um, what the, the uh, fares or costs would look like. Uh, Green Mountain has uh, still in analyzing that. But under the Americans with Dis Disabilities Act, the fare for paratransit um, can be twice as much as the regular fare. It's, that's what it's allowed, allowed to be. Um, and my understanding is... It doesn't is, seem fair. Pardon me? It doesn't seem fair. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's, I mean, in my mind, it, maybe it isn't fair, but in some ways it's, it's, um, it's more direct service. I mean, it, the reality is it's a more costly service. Um, I mean, it, in, 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 you know, and I think Green Mountain Transit is doing a lot of stuff to try to reduce those costs. I mean, part of when, when, the, when this whole paratransit idea came up, I mean, years and years ago, when the Americans with Disabilities Act came about, um, all they had were, you know, wheelchair lift equipped vans, and those are expensive to operate. And so yeah. that was part of the negotiating process. And plus, not only that, they break down also. Right. And they have to be repaired, yes. And so, <laughs> but Green Mountain Transit is doing a lot of things and using alternatives, using volunteer drivers, using some sedans. So they're looking at ways to reduce those costs. And so, as Dan says, we don't know yet. But it's also my understanding, typically, um, a lot of transit providers, and I can't speak specifically for Green Mountain, they would not um, charge a f charge anything for the the attendant or the caregiver to go with the rider. The rider would pay the fare, but the, there would be no no cost it's for the attendant. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Marla, this is more directed to you. Um, in big cities, um, here, here's a loophole or problem I see that maybe could be fixed. Um, it's against rule, especially in big city, uh, to leave a disabled or, or a person in a wheelchair, let's say, uh, on a bus alone. What I see here, and I've ran into issues uh, when we first got to Vermont, uh, where my wife, my, my wife is not wheelchair bound, but uh, um, there were other disabled people on the bus. If a driver has to go for a bathroom break, <laughs> okay, there should be a, another person, whether it can be a volunteer driver or another alternative to take over that driver's um, route while the person's on a lunch break or 15, 20 minute lunch break. You don't take your lunch break or bathroom break in the middle of, you, you see the, you, now how can we change that? Is there a way to change that by having a, a um, uh, a replacement driver, or can we see changes like that happening within GMTA? I think that would be a big problem by having another driver there just so the person could run and go to the bathroom, unless it was, I mean, a dire need type. But um, Personally, I don't leaving, think you should leave a disabled person on a bus, period. No, leaving the bus is not, not the right thing to do, but um, 
I, I don't know what the answer to that would be, except to maybe, uh, maybe just look at someone on your bus that seems responsible and say, I'll be right back, keep an eye on things if you need me. I'm in there, I, you know? Because mm -hmm. um, I, personally, I don't see someone just driving over and taking over the bus because I mean, except for lunch. I've never seen a bus driver have lunch before. So. I have. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, have I was not. just going to say, my, my personal experience has been um, that drivers have um, stopped at, at the regular stop. You know, they may be, they're, they're you're typically starting their route. So they may be a couple minutes ahead and need to sit there to, a few minutes to catch up time. So they may be off the bus literally for two minutes, not more, to go to the bathroom and come back on the bus. Um, and I think, I think the difference, and that goes back to one of the things that we're doing with this um, whole planning process is um, may, maybe that would be a, a bigger concern in a big city. Um, this is Vermont. Vermont is very different. And I think you would find that most Vermonters would say, eh, it's not a big deal. Um, I, we live I, in a dangerous world, though. Anything could happen. Well, anything can happen anywhere, and, and so to you anyone, to, you ha yeah. So <laughs> that's my point. You, you, well, you can't mitigate every kind of thing. I mean, the roof could fall down right now. It could, it's possible, mm -hmm. you know. And so I can't mitigate all of those possibilities. So we, we look at where we live, we look at where we are, and and we we make choices. And in this case, I'm I'm. I mean, that what I started to say was that's why we were looking at this process because. This area is not like Chittenden County. It's a bigger area. Um, I don't know if this it, the situation that you are referring to happened in Chittenden County or if it happened in Washington County or where. Um, but um, I think we, Vermonters, my experience has been is they're very um, much want to do things a Vermont way. They're not necessarily going to follow a big city pattern or just because somebody else does it a certain way, they're, they're doing it that way. Mm -hmm. um, Misconceptions with the power transit, okay? Um, now, going forward, uh, it, it, are they gonna be hiring more employees to do this, or is, it gonna, or, or is the power transit gonna be run by regular drivers? Or how, how do we see this happen? Well, the, the paratransit, as soon as GMT says we're switching to paratransit, it has to provide the service. Mm -hmm. And so it'll have to either use existing drivers or hire new drivers depending on what the need is. And mm -hmm. so, so that's something that will have to be done no matter what. Mm -hmm. And so some drivers, because if you're, uh, say, if they use the sedans, then you, don't, then you can hire someone that doesn't have to have their CDL license, right? Because uh, mm -hmm. they need that CDL license to drive the buses right now. Mm -hmm. And so there might be a scenario where you actually have a, a different tier of driver, right, um, that only drives the sedans or only drives the vans uh, that they have, if that's not a required for CDL. But, but that'll be on Green Mountain Transits to, to figure out. But as soon as they say we're offering paratransit, that's it. They're providing it. And so they'll have to provide the, the rides that are requested. And so, yeah. What is the board, the other board that you're on through GFTA, what, yep. how does this work hand in hand with that. Yeah, and so um, that board is the board that oversees the entire organization. It also authorizes the creation of all these, of, of all the routes and the spending of the money um, to operate, like say the Barry Hospital Health, to operate the paratransit service. So um, Green Mountain Transit will go through their own public hearing process, as well as develop a plan, present that plan and schedule to the board um, and then that board will approve or ask for revisions. And so when it's approved, then the Green Mountain Transit then has the ability to move forward uh, with the implementation. Their implementation schedule is actually matching up relatively well to our own implementation schedule. Our plan is, um, and our outline, um, is due to be completed at the end of December. Green Mountain Transit is then moving through a series of public hearings of their own changes through January, February. With the what hope, are some of those changes? Uh, those changes are to the Barry Montpelier Hospital Hill routes, as well as they're they're looking to more of them. Or uh, yeah, they're looking to increase frequency mm -hmm. uh, by making the the bus go bi-directionally. So it's gonna one bus will start in Montpelier, one bus will start in Barry, and and they'll cross in the middle, right? And so someone could get to the 
up to the mall more quickly, up to the hospital more quickly. And so instead of having to wait a full 60 minutes, um, which I think is why uh, you were you were mentioned about <laughs> having to wait 60 minutes at the mall. Yeah. 60 minutes yep, yep. at the mall. Yeah. They may end up having to only <laughs> wait 30 minutes, for instance, because the bus, they could get the next bus that's coming the direction that they need to go. And so, but ultimately, Green Mountain Transit hopes to really go through and have a presentation ready for the board in March. Um, to present to them, to ask for these changes, and then for the board to approve those changes. Um, anything more, well, of course we have more time, but do, anything you want to add to how to implement more changes? Well, I, I think as, I mean, in any process, it's helpful to sort of roll things out a little bit slowly. Um, I mean, I realize that there, uh, in terms of Green Mountain's entire territory, they're looking at changing routes in Chittenden County and tweaking all different kinds of things. And so uh, Dan mentioned the in this area, the Hospital Hill routes, and it would also affect the um, Barry Montpelier commuter between those two things. And as, as those things get rolled out, even if there are other things, there may be other things that, oh, we'd like to do, but eh, we're not sure quite yet. We have to see if, see if the funding. And I mean, one of the hopes is that these changes will increase ridership, and so that will increase funding a little bit. I mean, you don't get a lot from the fare box things, but you do get some. Yeah. And so, um, and then if, uh, if, I mean, that follows that if you can show towns that more people are in your town are riding the bus, then the towns are willing to contribute more money. Um, I mean, one of the things that um, I'm hopeful for, it's, um, you know, I don't know if it'll get phased in you know, in this plan that Dan talked about that may be implemented around March, it may be a little longer, but um, there are some needs in Barry City that aren't being met in terms of transit. And one of the... How, how so? Well, what, wh one of the, the things, um, the best way I can use an example in Montpelier, there's what we call this, the Montpelier Circulator. Mm -hmm. And it circulates around within the town, um, but it helps people you know, navigate uh, within the city fairly easily to get from different places, from Shaw's to the co-op or to the rec, rec center. And so those what's the difference things. between um, the circulator and, because um, I know, if I'm not mistaken, the circulator is the one that goes up to National Life. That's correct. Right. That's correct. correct. Yes. I would just, you know, and then the Hospital Hill goes to the hospital, Walmart, and some other Places. Applebee's, if you want to stop right, there, right. you know. Um, Correct. I mean, those are just those are two different routes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and the Barry City could benefit from a similar circulator within Barry City that one does not currently exist, uh, but they could also greatly benefit from having that kind of thing to help people get to. Um, you know, a lot of the, the shopping places have moved from the downtowns a little bit further out. Um, could help people get around and go to restaurants or banking or you know pharmacies, those kinds of things um, that um, they they have harder time doing now. Is Barry City going to have paratransit as well? Is it going well, to the, the the existing the, the proposed paratransit um, would be part of. I mean the the it would affect the the Barry Montpelier um, commuter route that that goes. Paratransit would follow there, so it would be in Barry. The Hospital Hill and the Barry, the Montpelier Hospital Hill and the Barry Hospital Hill also would be part of the paratransit system. So three quarters of a mile off of both of those routes is where the paratransit would um, extend. And I realize sometimes it's a little hard for people to sort of envision what three quarters of a mile is. Um, um, and I don't have a, we don't have a map with, with landmarks to look at, but that would be one way to look at it. If you go to, if you have access to Google Maps, you could look at that and figure out what that is. Um, generally speaking, I think p most people, if you have the ability to walk, I mean, a, a wheelchair user could, could probably do it a little faster, but most people probably can walk about two miles an hour, maybe a little faster, two and a half miles an hour. Um, so three quarters of a mile should, you know, maybe take you about 20 minutes. Um, and I mean that's a lot to walk, so hopefully <laughs> that would be the benefit of having the paratransit. But that should give people an idea. Now, paratransit. So paratransit, in a sense, they'll stop at the person's house. They won't 
Um, it won't be at a bus shelter. Uh, it'll go as uh, that, that is correct. As long, as long as their house is within that three quarter of a mile limit. Right. Ah, okay. Uh, uh, what would you like to add as far as future goals to the paratransit and how you see this in the broader future? Okay. So, or, well, everybody. I mean, I, uh, the future for me, I mean, I think is trying to find a, a way to actually serve more of our rural towns. People that live in the mountains. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. And so um, we're, we've been having a discussion in the Mad River Valley, right? So that's the towns of Warren, Waitsfield, Faston, Moortown, Duxbury. You know, th th those are the towns that really I've thought about as the Mad River Valley. And so it, ultimately, there's so many pe more people that are living out away from our um, our villages, mm -hmm. right? And so how do we, and, and that's And a, there's no way for them to get to right. a store. Yeah, or and, and, and again, and that's still a population of, of you know, that lives out there that's elderly, uh, that, that, you know, that are uh, people with disabilities, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so how do we serve those folks? And so developing um, into the future some type of system that, that may be more of a, well, we'll send out a few cars to pick up those folks, bring them into the fixed route system so they can then operate on that fixed route system and then return them home at the end of the day or whatever the scenario is. I think uh, trying to move forward and be more creative in the way that we're offering our, our, our transit you know, is going to be a key to its success. Mm -hmm. And so, so trying to, to crack that nut, I think, is a, is a real future goal. Uh, I've heard out of pl other planners, uh, both at the state level, through the Agency of Transportation, as well as uh, the other regional planning commissions. Uh, we're one of 11, you know, the Central Vermont is one of 11 regional planning commissions. I have a counterpart a transportation planner in every one of those offices, you know, and so, you know, so we've got, you know, a lot of information, a, a lot of knowledge to share and, and work collectively at. So what other work does the Planning Commission do, um, not the Transit Committee, but yeah. the Planning Commission itself? What, yeah. what exactly do you work on? Yeah, I mean, uh, just so people can know a little <laughs> bit more. Sure. I mean, um, w we are we have um, an office of uh, seven people, and 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 they they only range seven. <laughs> only seven. I know, I know. But they range in skills, right? So we have people that make maps for communities, right? So say they need a new map, a road map, or a, a map that shows where everyone lives in town, right? Using house addresses or whatever the scenario is, you know. So we have people that specialize in making maps and sharing those with communities. We have. We have planners that are um, that write plans that actually say, we want this type of vision in town. Help us craft a town plan that will meet this vision, right? Mm -hmm. And then develop a future land use scenario at, to actually so reduce that, that vision. So that green map, I yeah. think, uh, it's not a cartoon type of map, mm -hmm. but like if you're staying in a hotel, you get a mm -hmm. map of the stuff that's in town, like Absolutely. the restaurant. Is that yeah. part of your... We don't make those maps, but th we make similar maps to those. Yeah, we're really focused on like a municipal needs, right? The municipalities um, in our uh, county, there's 23 of them that we serve. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what do they need, right? A lot of times it's, I want to know where all the trails are. Show me where the trails are. I want to build a plan around connecting trails because I want to bring more uh, economy to my town by encouraging people to come and bike, recreate, you know, um, and really interact with our village centers. And so, so we do a lot of planning around that. Uh, I'm focused a lot on transportation, but also um, natural resource, like erosion. Where do we have erosion occurring on our roadways? How do we fix that erosion? How do we solve some of our um, um, green algae blooms that are happening in Lake Champlain? We're at the headwaters of the Winooski River that Winooski runs into Lake Champlain. Right? So we're planning, we're trying to help the state achieve its own goals. And so, so really a conduit between what the state wants to provide um, and what the towns need assistance with. And so and we're, we're, we're running the gamut, you know, whether it's sitting on a state committee or attending a local town planning meeting, right? You know, so we do it all. As far as GMTA and accessibility yeah. and people with um, disabilities <coughs> or special needs, one of the issues that I think that we could change, uh, like if you're, for example, and, and you can chime in on this, um, if you're at a bus shelter, you see the map uh, of the the times, mm -hmm. the the, the uh, time schedule. Yep. Right. I feel that uh, um, that could be larger print for people I who agree. need it, and yeah. also <laughs> heard that for a few. Yeah. And yes. and also here's another suggestion: the. Um, 
um, the maps that you get or the time schedules that drivers give out. Yeah. I know it's money to make things, mm -hmm. larger print or braille, because uh, braille costs lots of money to make it, it's thicker paper, mm -hmm. but um, maybe having a uh, larger print of, th of those schedules. I uh, believe you can request those. Yep. Yeah, larger yeah, print. Can. Okay. Yes. Can. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. During our community meeting, there was a representative from Green Mountain Transit. Um, Jordan was there, mm -hmm. um, and he was telling us that um, anyone can make that request. But I agree. I think it should be almost standard practice at some point. Yeah. It just needs especially to be at a bus practice. shelter. It, it's it, being the fact that I have a visual impairment is really hard to see that, and some of those things or schedules are old mm -hmm. that are still there yeah. or antiquated as far as the yep. date, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, I think uh, Green Mountain Transit, uh, want, uh, they, they create this best bus map and guide, and they can get rather complicated depending on the type of deviation that can happen, the type of request that can be made on routes. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that Green Mountain Transit really heard during the next, you know, gen study is that they need to streamline their service. They need to make it easier for the users of the service to understand how to use the routes, right? What's the time? If it says a time and I know where to go to get the bus, the bus will arrive at this time, right? You know, that's what they really... Sometimes it doesn't happen that I, way. I agree, I agree. But the ultimate goal should be, you know, if it's printed, it should be able to happen at that time. And, and the time point surveys that they end up doing, um, you know, you know, and their, their on-time performance, that all plays a role, you know, into, you know, making sure that what they print is what they can commit to. I mean, that's, yeah. that's one of the, the reasons that this whole process has come about also <coughs> is because they recognize that it's difficult for people who uh, are expecting a bus to be at a certain spot at a certain time, especially like on the Barry Montpelier um, Hospital Hill runs, because those are routes that allow deviations. And of course, they try to factor in enough time to do those deviations, but sometimes obviously it doesn't work. Uh, so deviation would be like if... Um, someone has to go to a medical appointment or Co uh, correct or a, a, um, there's a rehab gym up on the Barry Montpel I think it's on Barry Montpel well, I'm not sure first the name of that yeah there is one there that's the Ranger Road. So first and fitness yeah. yep yep that's yeah. Ranger yeah. Road yeah mm -hmm. yeah correct and so so that can sometimes throw off that schedule and so part of this whole next gen process has looked at that and and recognizes for a lot of people that's a problem and so one of the things that this new proposal would do by doing away with the deviations, it would streamline that schedule. It would be easier for the buses to stay right on time. Uh, so people would know I'm gonna, the bus is gonna be here at this time and it's gonna get me to where I wanna go at this time without having to worry about, you know, oh, am I gonna be on a run that has a deviation? So I'm gonna be 10 minutes late or something like that. And in the same way, because that gets streamlined, it's also going to be easier to streamline the route schedules, the actual printed papers that they hand out on the buses, um, so it will be a little bit easier to read as well. That's not to say that they are available in large print. Um, you could <laughs> no, probably we, get one we in understand. We understand that cold weather is upon us soon. Um, Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we're getting hail. Uh, but my, uh, my question is this. Um, has GMTA ever stopped or n not run due to bad weather or deviated schedule? Or, or, or here's another thing. Will paratransit drivers, because uh, black ice is one of those things that's really hard to see for, for anyone with a visual impairment um, will, because uh, I know in New York and some big cities, what they do is they, the paratransit people get off the bus and help the person to their door because they can't see the black ice. Will that happen or how, how uh, you know, will yes. they help them to their door? May, will I, they, huh? may I say that I've yes. always found that all the drivers are very helpful and if someone needs to get to a certain spot. I've seen a lot of them just get out and help them to get where they need that's to go. That's my being more courteous, yep. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Okay. Don't you feel that's a Vermont way as well? Yeah, that is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. everything yeah. Is, is, is better here than yep. is. Yeah. Um, 
But, but to answer ahead. your question about the weather, the answer is yes. They have canceled service during some of the more severe um, snowstorms. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and they will, they do um, try to notify people that they know or want to operate that route. And they usually give at least them an option, one final run, right? This is the last run we're going to operate. If you want to, if you, if you have to get back to Waterbury, you have to get back to St. Johnsbury, this is the run you have to take. And so they'll notify the people. And, and they really, Green Mountain Transit really, um, there's a number that you can um, that you can call into and add your phone number to, and it's, it will call you if there's some change in their schedule. And what so, is that number? Do you have it? Oh, I don't know it off the top of my <laughs> head. It's, it's on their bus mapping guide. Okay. Um, so it's right so there. So if anybody wants to contact yeah. the, the Power Transit Committee, for any questions they may have after this program airs, or um, uh, what is the number that they can reach? Yeah, they can call me. Uh, they can call me, Dan Courier, at my office. The number is 802-229-0389. And that will, that's a, a general office number. So if, you, if someone picks up and they're like, hi, this is Ashley, just ask for Dan. And, I'll, and I'm, if I'm not there, please leave me a message. Mm -hmm. Yep. And shouldn't we also mention that we get the survey out now? Absolutely. That, thank you. Yes, yeah. um, if you want to mention yep. about the survey. And so uh, one item that's about to be released um, um, is a survey basically uh, for the, the riders um, and for potential riders of the paratransit service to help provide feedback to us as we craft our outline. We'll be surveying through October and November. Um, and the survey will be available um, online as well as hard copy and, and so in the online version there's a, a web map uh, sorry a, a web version uh, that you can fill right out online I'm also going to create a, um, um, a word version and probably a PDF version as well because um, uh, Lauren you've been sharing how hard it was for you to use your um, your text to reader yeah. um, and so um, I was gonna chat with you about that some more and what's the right format for the survey to be in because um, I want to make sure that all the accommodations that people use can utilize the survey right. yeah. and then send it to me um, is yeah. what we want. And they can mail it, it email it. I feel it yeah. should be accessible oh. for some people with visual impairments that, you know. Absolutely, yeah. And you should know that is the ultimate goal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, well, does anyone want to add anything before we end? I guess my biggest one was getting the survey out there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, what, yeah. I mean, we, we can't. The survey is really important, and we'll get it out, but we have to get input from people. If nobody responds, we aren't going to have good answers. We, we won't have enough data to um, work put, a, put a good outline together that these right. are the needs of the people in Washington County. And, and the, the important need needs, especially for people with disabilities. Yes. Yep. Well, I would like to thank um, the Transportation Committee for joining me today on this edition of Ableton on Air. Uh, for more information, uh, Dan, what is the number again that they sure. can reach you? They can call me at 802-229-0389 and just ask for Dan. Okay, this puts an end to this edition of Able Dinner on Air. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time.